So actually, I'd, I'd like to begin today by commenting on something that you said right at the beginning of the session, Julie, and that was a question about what clinical markers we might be able to use in the future to actually predict Alzheimer's disease the way we use Drusen to predict AMD. And I remember being a graduate student and encountering John Dowling's book, Retina. And I, everyone knows that book is Retina, but the rest of the title is Retina, an approachable part of the brain. There's a lot of evidence that's emerging now that suggests that the pathophysiologies of AMD and Alzheimer's disease are actually quite similar. That if you break down Drusen, for example, you'll see a lot of the same amyloid plaque deposits that you see in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient, and that people with age-related macular degeneration are about nine times more likely to develop dementia of some sort. So maybe Drusen will actually turn out to be your biomarker for Alzheimer's disease as well. To switch gears a little bit, I'm, I'm not actually here to speak about AMD or about retinas at all. I'm actually here to speak about challenges in evaluating um, this relationship that we look at between cognitive function and xanthophils, and to do this across multiple levels of analysis. So we heard an excellent talk earlier from Dr. Cohen that focused really specifically on the sort of behavioral psychometric side. I'm going to take a few steps back now and talk about first cognition itself, and second, to talk about the various levels of analysis that we can use to examine cognition. A few disclosures before we start. Um, for illustrative purposes, I'm going to be presenting a little bit of novel data from a clinical trial that we have going on. That trial was actually funded by Abbott Nutrition, and for a portion of the data collection, I was actually employed by Abbott Nutrition, so I wanted to go ahead and make that disclosure before we go any further. And now I want to ask us a question, and that question is very simply, what is cognition? We've been speaking about cognition and measuring cognition and looking at cognition in our patients, but I think it's worth it to actually take a few steps back and ask the question, what is it? What is this thing that we're trying to measure and understand? And one of the things to know about cognition is that it's a bit more complex, I think, than, than we have been sort of making it out to be as a field. Now, first things first, when we talk about cognition, we first have to get information actually into the brain to be processed, to be analyzed, which relies on relatively intact sensory systems. So step one is actually getting information into the brain itself. Step two is looking at the brain itself and trying to understand what is the structural integrity of this tissue? Is it performing optimally? Do we have sufficient redundancy in youth to enable us to actually continue to process information as we age and begin to lose? Step three, of course, is to actually look at different strategies of processing information. We actually need to take a look at how our brain is using the structure that it has to get us to some functional outcome in the world. And finally, of course, there is the functional outcome in the world. And as I was putting this slide together and actually Google imaging older adults doing things, apparently what this means for all of us as we continue to age is we're going to look like this and be very upset as we start to process information. So hopefully we actually won't end up on this side of the Google image database as we proceed. Now, if I wanted to make this a very accurate model, I would have to split most of these into different parts. For example, a lot of the processing that you're doing right now is completely unconscious. If I were to ask you whether or not your clothing is comfortable, now that I said it, you're all thinking about it. There's that strap that's kind of digging in in the wrong spot, or maybe you're a little cold now that I mention it. Until I said that, you weren't actually processing that information despite the fact that that information was actually coming in. So a lot, of our, a lot of our cognition, our processing, is actually unconscious. So I would have to divide this strategy perspective up. We would have to look at the impact of different, different states of the brain as we're actually processing information. And of course, every arrow that you see on the screen should not only also go backwards, it should connect to every single other space on the screen. So what is cognition? Each one of these individual facets, as you're about to see, influences cognition. That processing, that handling of information that is something that is a bit invisible to us for the most part. At the end of the day, what we as a field usually tend to measure, as Dr. Cohen said, is, is this. It's this one slice. So what I want to do today is actually take us through multiple levels of analysis here. And I want to look at each of these individual parts broken down. And instead of looking at an Alzheimer's disease population, I have to admit that that's not the group that I study. I actually do lifespan work starting with young, quote, healthy individuals, which we're about to learn are perhaps not so healthy as we think they are. 
and to go up through those points of mild impairment where we're almost to the point of transitioning over. So when we talk about sensory systems, one thing that we understand about them is that they tend to alter with age. Older adults, of course, are at far more risk for age-related cataract than younger adults, which is why, of course, we call it age-related cataract. So we have a number of conditions that can influence the quality of information that's actually coming in to this brain to be processed. How does altering sensory input actually change cognition? We actually have a long history of research that suggests that it does. Here's a great example from the 50s, and those of you who work with patients in an optometry setting can probably relate to this when you notice that your, about a quarter of your AMD patients may, exper may be experiencing a little bit of visual hallucination. These are results from, um, this, is, this was a study published actually in 1953 where a, a number of individuals with psychotic disorders like schizophrenia were actually underwent a very basic cataract removal. And simply removing that cataract almost instantly caused an increase in positive symptoms of schizophrenia. They started to hallucinate. They started to engage in delusional thinking just as a result of altering visual input into the brain. Now, that's, of course, what happens when you change input into a brain that already has some difficulty. With our dementia patients, this was from last year's Alzheimer's Association meeting, one thing that we see is that if we take our dementia patients and do something as simple as remove their cataracts, we get an instant boost in cognitive function. It may not be long-lived, but we do see that changing the input in tends to change what sort of function we see at the end of the day. Now let's go to that next level of analysis. Let's look at brain itself. Certainly structural integrity of the brain is necessary for maintaining solid cognitive function. It is the case undoubtedly that I could, as Dr. Cohen suggested, ask everyone in the room to remember as many, uh, to remember as many words on a list as I can give you or to say, let's all name the number of four-legged animals that we can in a minute and we will all score comparably to each other. That being said, the underlying neurological structure that is producing those responses may not be perfectly comparable between us. Those of us who are older will have a little bit less brain volume, for example, than those of us who are younger. We're able to maintain function despite that fact. We can reach a critical point, though, where loss is too much. We've lost enough cortical volume, enough white matter here that we actually start to change the way we process. This beautiful, healthy brain starts to look a little bit more like this one. Now, we know that Alzheimer's disease and what we'll call, quote, senile dementia involve a loss of neurons. And they, they involve losses of neurons pretty much uniformly, but very specifically in higher concentration in specific areas of the brain, like the basal forebrain. We know that this is not unique to Alzheimer's patients, that losing brain volume, period, tends to result in impaired cognitive function. These are individuals who are at risk for stroke who also tend to then have lower brain volume and lower cognitive function as a result. And of course, we know that this is plastic. Yes, age is inevitable. And the question, is aging the disease, is a bit of a good one, because loss is inevitable with age. That being said, loss of this type at this rate is not necessarily inevitable. If we do something like engage in physical activity, we can actually alter brain volume and then cognitive function as a result. So, the brain issue itself is a little bit more complex even than we first thought. Let's look at processing strategy itself. We know that the brain does not age uniformly. As we take a look at various regions of brain, for example, I think we have a tendency, and, and this is certainly a sound practice with younger participants, to say, oh, this is the memory part of the brain, this is the thinking part, this is the emotional part, this is the planning part. But one thing that has to happen as we start to lose brain volume in these various regions. For example, if we look at lateral prefrontal cortex, you can see it really diminishing in volume with age. You can see inferior parietal basically maintaining through older age. So functionality, as it starts to change, one thing we have to do as we lose, quote, real estate in one part of the brain is compensate. We have to change our processing strategy to compensate for that loss. So, if you look, for example, at, at areas of activation in, in performing cognitive tasks in our young adults, you can see a relatively modular brain, specific parts working on specific parts of the problem. When we look at older adults who can either successfully perform the task or perform it more poorly, what we can see is that the processing strategy has become very different in those adults who successfully do the task. They're compensating. 
There are a lot of different models for how older adults compensate. There's the Herald model out of University of North Carolina area. There's functional dedifferentiation. There's scaffolding. We have lots of explanations for how this process might be happening. But in some form or another, it really does seem to be happening. So the processing strategy that our underlying nervous system actually uses to deal with information may change as we age. And finally, as we continue on our aging cascade, the end result, of course, is more or less successful execution of these behavioral problems. So what part of this cascade that I've shown you, and, and I've shown you the ways that it changes with age, very simply, by the way, this would require a lot more explanation and an entire semester to sort of get out fully, but which part is cognition? Classically, I think we would argue that this part is classically defined as cognition. What we have been measuring so far in this field really is this part, more or less successful execution of tasks. Now, there is value, obviously, to focus here. This is easy to do. We can actually do this with our patients. But I'm going to argue that there is also some things that we really need to consider. And, and I'm going to keep this part quite brief, because Dr. Cohen did a great job of going through this. One thing that we have in the literature right now, I think, and, and the, the question about the ticks and ARIDS 2 brought this up beautifully, and that is a little bit of category confusion. We have indices out there that are built for a specific population. Right? Those older adults, for example, who may be experiencing signs of memory loss. And we give certain indices to figure out the extent of that loss. If I gave everyone in this room the tics or the mini mental state, we would do great. Unless, of course, it's 7.30 at night and you call me to give me the tics and Game of Thrones is on. I won't be doing well then. Or I've had my nightly glass of wine which is a little bit of an issue with calling people at home to, to ask them to count backwards by seven from 100. You know, I, I, don't, I think I would fail at that task myself if, I'm, if Tyrion Lannister is on. So this is another issue, I think, with this measurement as a whole. But the goal of these measurements is to do something like stage loss. So if we give this measurement to all of us in the room, we're all going to score, for the most part, between the 27 and 30 range, which is the category of, of no impairment. So if I give us all a xanthophil supplement and I look for us to improve for that point, I've given the wrong test because I can't get higher than a 27 or a 30. I'm, I'm never going to score above normal on this particular test. So when you use tests like this for the purpose of ascertaining, quote, function, these tests tend to be a, a little bit better designed to assess dysfunction than they are function. So we have other weapons in our arsenal here. We can do things like direct measures of function. I, I have an image here of the short physical performance battery, which some of us have given when we want to understand how someone's physical body relates to cognitive processes. And we have people actually do physical tasks. Um, another example of this from the cognition perspective would be the DAFs, the direct assessment of functional status, where we, for example, give people a grocery list. And in the lab, we have a little grocery store set up. And we say, OK, give me your list back. Go shop. Get the correct things. Use the right money. Pay for it. And we'll count out your change. That's very different. That's requiring a lot of resources to actually have them go out and execute a real world task. Now, we can also use what I always like to sort of jokingly call cognitive functional reductionism, right? Tasks that are designed to try to isolate one specific domain of function. And Dr. Cohen has already pointed out that when we do that, we can even get into a little bit of category confusion in this domain. Are we measuring executive function? Is the task actually being used to measure something like verbal fluency? Are they related? Are we calling on the same neurological resources? Very, very difficult to tell sometimes with a test like this, but they are easy to execute and, and seem to be otherwise pretty well validated. So one of our goals was actually to try to do this, was instead of, of you know, sort of taking the strategy of measuring a lot of different subjects on a very small slice of, quote, cognitive functional measures, what we really wanted to do was go for multiple levels of analysis, to actually try to understand, as we now relate the story back to xanthophils, how xanthophil status relates to function when function is defined across these various levels of analysis. So what you're looking at, and I, I feel like I need a cool acronym for this, because everybody else had an acronym. So maybe over drinks later, we can figure out a neat acronym for this trial. But uh, Acronym aside, one of our goals here was to actually look at these various levels of analysis in an ongoing clinical trial. 
So the trial will actually wrap in September, so you're getting a sneak peek here. Next year, you'll get the full story. And uh, we have 102 predicted completers who will be finishing this trial in September. In fact, the bulk of them have already finished. We have a few stragglers kind of left behind. Um, you'll see that we really stratified our sample. We have 51 young, healthy adults in this trial. Healthy, I'll put in quotes. These are folks ages 18 to 30 years old. They're students at the University of Georgia. And we have 51 community-dwelling elders. We oversampled a little bit in the beginning in folks who have mild cognitive impairment. These are folks who 50% of the time on our neuropsychological evaluations would test relatively normally, and 50% of the time are going to look like they have some impairment. These are folks who understand that they are starting to grasp for words and do some of those basic kind of problematic things. Now, these folks were given 12 milligrams of lutein and zeaxanthin in a mixed supplement, or placebo. It is a double mask trial, and uh, it is the result of a lot of collaboration. So you're looking at, <laughs> excuse me, a few of our collaborators here. As you can see, uh, we've, we've, used, we've used neuroimaging resources at the University of Georgia. Um, University of New Hampshire is involved here. Joanne Karen Celentano is actually doing our serum analysis for us. And um, we have some great sponsors who are involved in this trial that we, we owe some thanks to. So when I said multiple levels of analysis, we really meant it. Our goal here was to look at on one level, we've got anthropometrics, diet, uh, macular pigment, optical density, just things that are telling us something about the status of these individuals. On our second level of analysis, we have sensory input. So we're actually going to look at that input into the nervous system. On our third level of analysis, we have structural integrity of the nervous system. And you can now see the danger, by the way, of creating a PowerPoint on a different platform than one it's shown on. So my apologies for any overlap of wording here. We have a structural integrity branch here where we're going to actually be looking at uh, structural images of the brain, trying to figure out how brain volume and changes in brain volume might be relating to some of our outcomes. We are looking at processing strategy, both passively and actively. We have adults doing very demanding tasks and doing very, very easy and very passive tasks. And we'll look to see how activation changes over the course of the year. We'll be looking at some of these functional behavioral tasks. Um, we're actually having individuals go out and do physical batteries, shop in the grocery store, do all of those things as well. And then we're going to look at some of those diagnostic and, and more, quote, functionally redu reductionist standard cognitive tasks. Now, this is a year-long trial. So we're, we're measuring baseline, four months, eight months, and over here should be 12 months. Again, I apologize. This, this looked a bit different on my screen. Um, and you can see that at baseline, we're sort of throwing the book at the problem. Um, all levels of analysis are included at baseline and at 12 months. And at four and eight, we're really checking up on things like serum carotenoid levels, macular pigment optical density. Um, we're doing some of these you know, cognitive tasks just to check in. To give you, though, some appreciation of what our participants are going through during this trial, these are a few of the measurements that are happening in these various levels of analysis. Each participant in this trial spends more than 30 hours in the lab with us not counting the fact that we do call them every other week to check in on them, see how they're doing with compliance, and of course, you know, interrupt their Game of Thrones watching. So this is an every other week compliance check-in that we do, and then they spend 30 full hours in lab with us over the course of the year. And I will say this, we oversampled our mildly cognitively impaired group in the beginning. Maintaining that group over the course of the year was incredibly difficult. There was immense pressure for a lot of our participants to undergo drug trials. Their neurologist would say, I don't want you taking this nutrition crap. I need you on Nemenda or Aricept. So this was a real challenge for us. For those of you who have done similar trials, I would love to know how you have fared. So let's look at some of these preliminary results. And we're going to actually check out multiple levels of analysis here. So one thing that we'll do, I'll show you some young adults first. Um, when we take a look at some of these kind of functionally reductionist tasks, this is a visual memory task. Um, we're having our adults do things like look at a series of images, try to encode that image, and then later on when we repeat images back to them, have them actually respond, yes or no, I saw that or I didn't. And one thing that we have, have been able to see as a bit of a sneak peek is that in this population, these young subjects whose macular pigment optical density increased over the course of a year, for those subjects, we saw an improvement in their ability to do tasks like this. And that was independent of practice effects. So everybody who practices tests like this over the course of a year will get better. So these folks improved above and beyond practice effects. 
We saw it in this domain. We saw it in several others. We see it with cognitive flexibility, complex attention. As we give individuals tasks to do that really challenge them, that, that, have, that sort of keep them changing their criteria, changing what they understand to, uh, to be helpful here, we see that as macular pigment density increases, cognitive performance increases right along with it. Um, some of you may have seen this yesterday. Here's a little preview of, of something that some of you might have seen. The poster is still up if you want to see it by Anna Thorne, one of our graduate students. This is electroencephalography data. So what you're looking at here is 256 electrodes on the surface of the scalp recording electrical activity of the brain underneath. Each individual electrode is getting a signal from thousands of neurons. And what you can see, these are older adult data now, are that our older adults with high macular pigment optical density tend to have more activity as they're doing this task than those with low macular pigment density. Now think about that. These are individuals who have, in, in our high group, about 0.7 on average, in our low group, about 0.28. Lutein and zeaxanthin status has influenced activity of the nervous system. These are direct measures of neurological activity in the brain. Now we see this on a very gentle passive task where they're just simply looking at an object. When we give them what uh, our other graduate student, Will Oliver, has called a visual nightmare to look at, where there is an incredible amount of noise and chaos on the screen, and older adults are having to ignore a lot of extraneous information and only attend to specific parts of this hugely rapidly moving situation on the screen, we also see differences in a, in a task like this. So our individuals in this case with higher macular pigment tend to have less activation while they're doing this really demanding task. Our folks with lower macular pigment really seem to have to work to be able to make this happen. Let's look at a couple of other very brief examples. This is magnetic resonance imaging data. This is functional MRI. And what we're looking at here are folks who have been given a verbal memory task. Words are paired together, and they have to then recall whether or not they've seen those word pairs before. You can see the general pattern of activation that we tend to see in these adults. And one thing that we found is that our folks with low levels of macular pigment, less macular pigment optical density, related to increased utilization of compensatory processing. They were having to grasp, change the magnitude of their response, and invoke different processing strategies to do the same task. We see the same thing with our visual tasks. It's per particularly in regions like left middle frontal gyrus and right superior parietal lobe, we see activation differences in adults with our higher levels of macular pigment. So again, what all of this is saying is that macular pigment density is relating to differences in brain activation and processing strategy, different level of analysis altogether. So I want to conclude here with a few points, and, and that is the sort of concept of category confusion. And what we do when, as in trials like ARIDS 2, we get a null result. What does that actually mean for us? Well, the first thing to say is that one thing that we are attempting as a group to do is, in Gerald Edelman's words, right, solve something that is wider than the sky. This is the most complex structure in the known universe. I, I love to make the comparison with students to the internet, right? I mean, we understand that the internet is a sort of vast network of connections and links. The brain is far more vast even than that. So when we get a null result, one thing we have to ask is, did we use the right test for the right population? Did the test, the population, and the, the function that we're trying to test actually align with each other? If not, our null result might be artifactual. If it's the case that we ask a, a sort of extreme behavioral question, and test it in the wrong way, or we're trying to really ask a functional question and instead just look at the behavior, maybe again we've operated on the wrong level of analysis. In this case, it's an analysis mismatch. Finally, to some extent here, there is power in nothing happening. To your point, Randy, if we, if we take an individual with Alzheimer's disease, we give them a bunch of xanthophils, and we say, gosh, their cognitive function didn't improve, what were we expecting? In some cases, not improving OK, we, we sort of get that. Not declining further might be a really good outcome. Null results can mean truly, quote, nothing happened. Null results can also mean we didn't see a change for the negative, right? Our adults didn't necessarily get worse during the course of this intervention. And for some of the things that we're looking at now, there might be some real power in that outcome as well. 
So I'll open it up for questions. So thank you for your enthusiastic, energetic talk. This is clearly your passion, so it's great to to see this. And Did see you just call me a geek? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like us all. But um, the the interventional trial, had you a placebo group? We do. You do, okay. Because mm -hmm. I think, to, to your point about success is not declining, we can only really deal with that and understand it if we have that placebo group, so that's important. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in how you quantify your assessment of you know, your movement experiment, getting them to stand and put their hand in their head. How do you actually quantify and use that in, in, in the context of a clinical trial? Great question. One of the things that we, that we definitely understand about cognition, and this is something that um, needs a lot more work, certainly. One, thing, one observation we've had over the years, and, and by the way, that when we talk about functional assessments, that's a physical one, but we also have people do things like solve problems in a real world scenario that is cognitively demanding, like giving a grocery list, going shopping, actually paying for it, you know, counting out change, doing those things as well that are, that are sort of more purely cognitive. <clears throat> but one of the things that we do that um, some of our team is actually presenting these results at the end of the month um, at the Alzheimer's Association meeting is we have individuals, we test their physical function. One of the best markers, and I, I, I recommend this to, to folks in the clinic all the time, if you want to know how someone's doing, a really good marker is grip strength. How, how strong are they versus how frail are they? Frailty is a multi-symptom sort of thing that involves cognitive frailty, physical frailty, et cetera. So these things wrap together. So we, we use a, a technique called, a, a test called the short physical performance battery, where we have older adults do chair sits, for example. They have to do, execute a number of chair sits where they're standing up, they're not using their hands, they have to Sit down, stand up. We test their gait speed. They walk a set, um, you know, a set track, and actually we test how long it takes them to do that. We have them do basic balancing and standing exercises too to get an impression of frailty. There's a, a strong link between frailty here and frailty here. It's a multi-system thing. So we wanted again to capture as many levels of analysis as we could. So there's some standardized ways of actually doing that and figuring out systemically how well they're doing as well. Thank you. Lisa, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Uh, a question concerning the very impressive MPUD connection to the brain function, as you have also in your clinical trial, a parameter is called a critical flicker fusion frequency. So as I assume that when you are measuring macular pigment, you are you're also measuring upfront the CFF. Yeah. Do you have already any information about how a CFF is correlating to this different brain functions? Yes, that, Robert, that's a great question because CFF for me, often represents my own point of category confusion. So you, you may have noticed that I had CFF in the sort of visual input spot level of analysis. Quality of information coming in, how frequently can you sample your world? We, we recently looked at CFF and compared it against all of our other cognitive tasks, those functionally reductionist tasks, to see you know, how well these things actually related. CFF is something that can be done very quickly and very easily in a clinic. To, to get a good indicator of just processing speed. And we found that CFF was independently, now age is the biggest mediator of CFF other than physical properties like luminance of the stimulus. So we found that even independent of age, CFF was a great predictor of executive function, for example. So there's, there's co-relationships between these different variables. And in our past work, we've shown relationships between macular pigment and CFF. So these things all seem to be linking together. And, and the great thing about CFF is it's a very simple sort of atomistic look at whether or not the nervous system can kind of, quote, keep up with what's happening in its visual world. So those relationships do seem to be there. It links to macular pigment and CFF very independently links to specific domains of cognitive function. So those relationships are coming out. So you have a related, oh, go ahead. So you would recommend if you start measuring macular pigment, you should for this kind of trials already measure always CFF? I have to say that there's always two categories of answer for that question. There's best professional advice, which is what I do that, you know, and, and should you do that? And then there's what do you do with that once you've done that? So, you know, the answer for me is always yes, absolutely. You should definitely get a handle on something like CFF. It's been known for decades that this is a good measure of central function. What you do with that data is a, is a very, very good question. So you get a CFF number, does this mean that your older adult is likely to then 
you know, become cognitively impaired. And that's something that, that link is something that is still missing. Promising, though. Stuart? intervening on your results, say a neurologist wanting to put the patient on a drug, but there's uh, the agingbraincare.org center at Indiana University, which um, looks, uh, looks at the use of medication in general in the United States, and what they found is that 40 percent, it's a Medicare center of excellence, and they've been noted for this by the government and saving a lot of money because what they noted is 40 percent of all Alzheimer's disease diagnosis is really drug-induced delirium. So I'm wondering, all the drugs that people in this age group are going to be on, be taken off, how is that all going to be accounted for in your model? You have asked a wonderful question and highlighted a wonderful point. And fully one-third of our older adults are polypharmacy. They are taking four or more prescription drugs. Mostly, to your point, Dr. Griffiths, cardiovascular drugs. They're taking beta blockers, they're, you know, they're taking diuretics, they're taking things like that, statins, very often. And this is something that we're absolutely going to have to account for in our statistical model. There was a paper that uh, Randy and I did in, I think it came out in 2013 maybe, where we looked at statin use in macular pigment and found that the longer somebody was on a statin and the more dramatically they reduced the amount of circulating lipid that carries lutein and zeaxanthin, the lower their macular pigment tended to be. We even put a research participant just from a case study perspective onto a statin and found that there were differences between various statins. So uh, statins like Lipitor, atorvastatin, dropped macular pigment in the parafoveal area and I shouldn't say parafoveal area, I should say sort of less central area and taking something like rosuvastatin did not. So there are differences in the ways that the various statins even cross the blood-brain barrier. It's a complex problem. So one thing that we'll do, likely statistically, is, is, is take polypharmacy into account. But as you can see from the depth of the data, there's going to be a lot of analysis for a very long time. So, uh, so that's something that we will absolutely look at. We, we definitely have not gotten that extensive in our, in our serum measures. Um, right now, we're looking at carotenoids, tocopherols, things like that, very basics. We are, ask, we are giving dietary questionnaires. We're assuming a certain degree of B vitamin deficiency. We're looking at vitamin supplementation, whether our subjects are taking B, D, you know, things of that nature. But, you know, there is the bigger question I think that you've asked is one to benefits and drawbacks of a single nutrient strategy. Not that you know, lutein and zeaxanthin are nutrients per se yet, but we've taken a single or a couple of bioactive substances and given them to adults. Now that being said, it did something. You know, I mean, the, the, we can see that sort of independently of those other factors, for example, our young subjects improved. And we can see that our, at least at baseline here in these analyses, our older subjects are showing neurological functional differences based on presence or absence or, or high volume or low volume or high concentration or low concentration. Right. Well, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a complex question as we, as we try to understand something as multifactorial as aging itself on the brain, we, we definitely have to admit that there are going to be certain instances like you've mentioned that we're just not going to be able to account for in that study. Hopefully the, the volume of literature that's out there over years of study will get us answers to those questions. Okay, time for one more question. Thank Before you. I promise a quicker and narrower question. Um, uh, your MPOD data, where you, uh, which, which is fantastic, where you show that uh, people who show an improvement in that measure show improvement in cognitive performance or mm -hmm. vice versa. I wondered, 
Uh, not unrelated to that question whether that's true for both young and old, is it true independent of performance? Is there, are there interactions between or uh, regression to the mean kinds of effects there? Very, very good question. Um, and, and the unfortunately dissatisfying answer to your question is give us until September. <laughs> and we'll be able to tell you that. Right now we've been able to operate on a level as fine, and, and Dr. Gomez, I heard you say this too, we're not unmasked yet. We can see if people improved. That improvement could have been due to students saying, you know what, my diet sucks and I need to fix it. You know, it could be something that simple. So whether or not we can isolate the effects of the supplement is a September question. Um, certainly for us, as we've been looking at these data, taking our, our sneak peeks, what we're seeing is promising. So I'm going to hold you till September. And, uh, and stay tuned. Next year, we'll, we'll be able to really start teasing a lot of this out. OK, thank you. Let's take a break. Thank you.